Welcome back. Um, so I, I, we apologize for the weather. Uh, so the, given that the, 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 there is also wind, uh, the coffee break will be uh, just outside here, not on the terrace. And the posters uh, are in this hall that goes around uh, this uh, thing. Uh, so the, the, the poster session will take place there. Um, and the weather will be good for the weekend, so uh, it's okay. Uh, so we have uh, the fourth lecture about dark matter by Francesco Deramo. Okay, thanks and good morning everybody. Uh, so today is the last lecture on uh, dark matter and uh, just to recap what we have seen uh, so far, uh, we have, and this is not only something I cover in my lecture but also in, uh, in all the school, we know that dark matter is out there. Okay, from our observations, we know that it's there, it's five times more abundant than baryons. But these observations, they do not tell us anything about the mass of the particle physics properties. So we don't know what the dark matter is, we don't know how big the interactions are with some other particles. All we know is that it has gravitational interactions because we observe the gravitational effects on visible stuff that we observe. Okay, so from a particle physics perspective, when you try to propose a model and you try to propose ideas to what the dark matter could be, uh, there is not a clear uh, guiding principle, okay? So what we have done in the second and in the third lecture is to focus on a specific class of dark matter candidates that are called WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles that there are particles with mass between 10 GV and 10 TV, more or less, and with interaction cross-section with standard model particles of the order of weak scale processes. Okay, so that was the, the second and the third lecture. In the second lecture, we went through the thermal history of these models. We saw how these particles get produced in the early universe. And in the third lecture yesterday, we saw uh, two ideas, direct and direct detection to detect WIMPs today. Okay, so, the WIMP was one example of So the WIMPs were just one example of motivated dark matter candidates. So what do I mean by motivated? I mean that these particles have reasons to exist beyond the dark matter evidence itself, okay? There are reasons to believe that WIMPs must be around today because of the hierarchy problem, okay? This is a problem in particle physics and it boils down to understanding why the size of gravitational interactions are so different from the one of weak interactions, okay? Or in other words, why the Higgs mass is 125 GV instead of the Planck mass. And we can discuss that offline if you want about the hierarchy problem. But many solutions, supersymmetry, extra dimensions, little Higgs, they have a WIMP candidate already embedded in the framework, okay? So it's nice that the single theory solves two problems. And so that's why I call these candidates motivated because they have reasons to exist beyond the dark matter problem itself. So another candidate that I think it was uh, raised during the Q&A session a couple of days ago, is the sterile neutrino, okay? So the sterile neutrino, we also know that neutrino masses is one reason to go beyond the standard model because within the standard model itself, neutrinos are massless and uh, the problem with neutrino mass requires the addition at some scale of additional degrees of freedom, the sterile neutrinos, that they are gauge singlets under the standard model. And uh, the sterile neutrino, depending on its mass, so if the sterile neutrino is around EV, it cannot be the dark matter. Because remember, for a fermion, For a fermion, the dark matter mass has to be larger than 100 EV, 
that, that's from like observing very small dwarf galaxies using the Pauli principle and filling the Fermi sphere. That's abundant on the mass. So if you have sterile neutrinos of one electron volt, they can be there. They can account for neutrino masses, but they cannot be dark matter candidates. If the mass is above 100 EV, I don't know, between 1 and 10 KV, it's a very interesting region, then the sterile neutrino can be a dark matter particle. And uh, this is still viable, and uh, I will not cover during my lectures just because uh, I had to make a choice. Okay, I only have four lectures, and uh, I, I decided to speak about another class of candidates, so axions. And these are motivated also because they address another problem of the standard model, the strong CP problem that I will review now briefly. And uh, they are viable dark matter candidates, okay? So these three are examples of dark matter candidates that you do not postulate just to explain the observed abundance. You attack some other big problem. The are key problem, the neutrino mass, the strong CP problem, and automatically you also have a dark matter particle. So one theory, you solve two problems. That's why these candidates are nice. Of course, there is no reason why the observed abundance of dark matter must be explained by some particle solving some other problem, okay? So this is just uh, uh, to say that I'm not saying that dark matter has to be one of these three uh, candidates, but it's nice. So let's study the axions today. So these are, the, the idea goes back to the 70s, late 70s, early 80s. But when I was a student, I remember that people were obsessed with WIMPs and axions were not really popular. And I'm not talking about many years ago. But in the last five years, let's say, there was a, a, a revival of it, mostly driven by new experimental ideas. So people came up with new ideas to discover these particles. And uh, so there was an increasing interest on, uh, on axions uh, uh, as dark matter candidates again. Okay, so I decided to speak about this during this last lecture because it's, uh, I mean, there is a lot of interest in physics, but it's also very timely because it's a topic that if you read the archive every day, it has been discussed uh, a lot, okay? So I will first review the motivation for the axion so why we introduce an axion to the standard model. Then I will describe uh, how this particle can be a dark matter candidate. So as we will see, the range of masses is very different from the WIMPs. So these are extremely light dark matter candidates. The production mechanism, I will do a calculation of the abundance, is completely different. So it's something completely different than what we have seen in the first uh, three lectures. Okay, so let's start from uh, the strong CP problem. So this, is, this is a problem of the standard model, and it boils down to understanding why CP is respected so well by strong interactions. And uh, the best way to introduce this problem is just by looking at the QCD Lagrangian. So QCD is quantum chromodynamics. It's the gauge theory describing the strong force, okay, strong interactions. And uh, the QCD Lagrangian, so let me, let me write that and then I will comment piece by piece. Uh, I need to go down. So let's see what convention, okay. Okay, so this Lagrangian describes strong interactions. G is the field strength of the gluon. So this is the kinetic term of the gluon. This is just the gauge theory. Q are quark fields. So Q for me is a vector, and let's consider just QCD with two quarks, up and down. So these are the two lightest quarks, okay? 
So there is a kinetic term for the quark. This is the Dirac Lagrangian. So D slash is the Feynman notation is the contraction between the Dirac matrices and the derivative. And then there is a mass term for the quarks. Okay? So this mass term is a matrix. And uh, I take it to be diagonal and I take the masses to be real. Okay? So this Lagrangian describes very well everything we know about strong interactions. Okay? At very high scales, at very high temperature, the fundamental degrees of freedom are quarks and gluons. So in the early universe, when the temperature was above 1 GV, we had the plasma of quark and gluons that were not confined within hadrons. And then as the universe cools down, we went through a phase transition where quark and gluons confined into hadrons, like neutrons, protons, pions. Yes? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Sorry. Of course. So did you mean the covariant derivative? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, otherwise it's a bad gauge theory, yes, thanks. Yeah, yeah, so okay, the, sorry, there wasn't, yeah. Uh, why is not consistent? So, um, this is a vector of two Dirac fermion, and each U and D, they have left and right component. So yeah, it's this 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 vector here has two indices, a flavor index and a Dirac index. So you can expand and show that this is m u q bar, u bar u plus m d d bar d left and right. But I mean the notation are not important. All I want to say is that I'm taking the mass to be real for now. Okay, so that's that's important. Okay, any other question about the QCD Lagrangian? Okay, I mean, don't worry about the notation. All I, all I want to emphasize here is that there is a kinetic term for gluons, a kinetic term for quarks, and then there is the mass. We know the quarks have masses, okay? Okay, so this Lagrangian describes nature very well, describes strong interactions very well, and uh, he respects CP. So CP is a combination of two transformations, charge conjugation and parity. Charge conjugation, you just change the charge of the fields. Parity, you flip the three space directions. So from there to there, okay? So you can convince yourself that each of these operators is invariant under CP. And we observe that strong interactions do not violate CP. So this is good. However, if we write down the most general Lagrangian, if you write down the most general Lagrangian, well, we could write something else. Uh, well, okay, let, let me just write it this way. Okay, so these other two operators I wrote, they are renormalizable, and so in principle they can be there, okay? The first one is a dimensionless, dimensionless number, theta, times G, G dual. Here G dual is just the, is defined with the, the epsilon tensor, okay? So it's just the dual strength field of the glue. And uh, the second piece is, again, the same quark mass term, but now I put an overall phase to the quark mass matrix. If you remember, I said this matrix is real, but there is nothing wrong with having a phase, okay? The theory is still normalizable. Now, you can convince yourself that both of these operators violate CP, okay? They violate CP, or, by the way, T. T is a transformation where you flip the arrow of time. Oh, this. Thank you. Thanks. 
Yeah, so this is a if you want, this is a definition of G. Okay? So CPT is conserved. There is a well-known theorem in field theory, the CPT theorem. So violating CP is equivalent to violating T. Okay. Um, now, uh, you can see that without going into details, you are always free to perform rotations. Basically, you can perform transformations on this Lagrangian and you can put the phase either all on this operator, all on this operator. This is just to say that there is only one invariant quantity, which is this difference here, okay? So it's true that I wrote here two operators, one for the gluon field strength with its conjugate, the other one with the quark, a phase in the quark mass matrix. If you perform chiral rotations on quarks, you can put all the phase here or all the phase here. It's up to you. There is a physical invariant combination, which is the difference between these two phases. And this difference, uh, I'm sorry, I think there is a two here because it's a number of, but it doesn't matter. The only important thing is that there is a physical invariant quantity, which is a combination of these two phases. And if you compute any green function, any matrix element, it can only depend on this combination, of course, because that's something you observe, okay? So what are the consequences of having this, these two new operators? Or in other words, consequences of introducing CP violation in the theory of strong interactions that it can just be there. These are renormalizable operators, okay? There is no reason why we should not write them down. Uh, the consequence is that you induce neutron electric dipole moment, okay? So an electric dipole moment for a particle like the neutron would violate CP because the interaction is D, the dipole moment, times E, the electric field. And you can uh, do the, I will not do the calculation, but there are standard techniques to compute the neutron dipole moment as a function of theta bar. And you see that, of course, it's proportional to theta bar. And it's very common to write that in these units. So a dipole moment, an electric dipole moment is an electric charge times a distance. Okay, if you have two point-like charges with opposite sign, the dipole moment is the charge times the distance. So the units of D are E, which is the electron charge, so the charge of the electron or the proton, times centimeters. So these are the units that they're usually used to express neutron dipole moment. And it's proportional to theta. So if theta goes to zero, of course the effect goes to zero because we do not have CP violation anymore. Okay? So let's compare this number with the experimental bound. Experimental bound is 10 to the minus 26 E times centimeters. I'm using the same units. So I compare theoretical prediction with experimental bound, and I conclude Okay, so let me write that again. So this is the strong CP problem. Okay, we have one dimensionless parameter in the QCD Lagrangian, theta bar, which is the invariant combination of theta and theta of the quarks. So this parameter is actually the difference of two phases, one appearing in the gluon field strength, one appearing in the quark mass matrix. And experiments tell us that this number has to be very, very small, okay? So whenever we have a small number, we would like to understand why it is so small. So there is nothing wrong if you put in the Lagrangian by hand this parameter to zero or even to 10 to the minus 12, okay? But it's 
a lack of understanding. We have a small number, we want to understand where it comes from. Okay? So this is the strong CP problem. And the axion is a solution to the strong CP problem. And while it solves the strong CP problem, it also provides a dark matter candidate. So that's what we will do today. We will see uh, how to compute the relative density for the axion once I define what the axion is. Is that clear, the problem, and what we're going to do? OK. So let's see how the axion solves the strong CP problem. Okay, so the basic idea is the following. And by the way, this is also known as the Pechai Queen mechanism or PQ. And Pechai and Queen were the two people that in 1977 proposed this mechanism as a solution to a strong CP problem. And uh, the idea is the following. So the basic idea is that you, you promote the theta parameter to a field, okay? So in this extension that I'm about to perform of the standard model, the theta parameter appearing in that Lagrangian is not a number anymore, but it's a, it's a dynamical field that evolves with time. It's a dynamical scalar field, it has to be a scalar. And uh, what we will study is the dynamical evolution So this parameter becomes a field. We are going to study the equation of motion of this field through the expansion of the universe. And we will see that dynamics will drive theta bar to zero today. And that's why we do not observe uh, violation of, C of uh, CP by strong interactions, okay? Okay, so just in words, how you achieve this I will just outline the few key steps, okay, to, to get to this uh, dynamical field, and then I will, we will compute the relic density. Okay. Okay, so, of course, the first thing you have to do is to extend the standard model. Otherwise, uh, we already know the theory. So, you extend the standard model by adding new degrees of freedom at high scale. And you want your theory to have an abelian symmetry. So abelian symmetry like a U1, okay, just rotation by a phase. And this symmetry has to be broken in the vacuum, so spontaneously broken, the same way the X boson, sorry, the X field breaks electroweak symmetry down to E and M, okay? So here you have something analogous, it's just, it's not the gauge symmetry, it's a global symmetry, but it's the symmetry of the Lagrangian and the vacuum state breaks this symmetry. And also you want this symmetry to be anomalous, under QCD, and we will see what I mean by this. But first, let's focus on the first uh, requirement. If we have a global symmetry, which is the symmetry of the Lagrangian, but it's broken by the vacuum state, we know from the Goldstone theorem that this theory has to have a Goldstone boson. Okay, so this is a famous result 
from the 60s, I think, by Jeffrey Goldson. Whenever you have a gl uh, global symmetry broken by a vacuum state, by the vacuum state, then for each broken generator, you have a massless degrees of freedom. A Goldson boson is a particle with zero mass, and uh, we call this Goldson boson the axion. Okay? And I will call him phi. Okay, so this is the Goldstone boson. There are also, in the literature, you may find the axion called A, lowercase a, but since A is also the scale factor, in order to avoid confusions, I will call it phi, okay? But you may find the axion called also A. So also, let's introduce the scale where you break this symmetry. I call it F, okay? So, I said that the vacuum state of nature breaks this U1 symmetry, but at what scale? Well, this is a free parameter of the theory that is subject to experimental constraints, but for now, let's call it F. And the idea, again, is analogous to the electroweak symmetry, where the X field breaks electroweak symmetry at the scale V, which is 200 GV, more or less, the Fermi scale. Here, it's an unknown parameter of the theory, but we will see with what we need in order to reproduce the, the relic density. Uh, okay, so the last thing we need to uh, exploit is the fact that this symmetry is anomalous under QCD. What does it mean? It means that this field phi, and I'm using now 8 pi f, uh, yes. So I'll give you the result, and you have to trust me here, but you can show that if the symmetry is anomalous under QCD, then you induce a coupling between this Goldstone boson and the gluon field strength, precisely to the operator GG dual. So this is what I meant when the parameter theta becomes, is promoted to a field, okay? Now in the Lagrangian, I don't have a number anymore. I have a dynamical field phi, and of course, the operator in the Lagrangian has to have dimension four, so, this has dimension four. I have a scalar field with dimension one. I need to divide by a scale, and the scale will be the scale where I break the symmetry, F, okay? But this operator is very important for two reasons. First of all, it shows us how the theta parameter becomes dynamical, okay? So if I want to know what theta is today, dynamical, I have to solve the equation of motion for phi, which is what we will do today, okay? In the expanding universe, accounting for the Hubble expansion. So that's the first uh, important thing. The other thing is that I said before that when you break a global symmetry, you get the massless Goldson boson. Well, not quite here, because the symmetry is anomalous. It's not an exact symmetry. It's broken by quantum effects. And so you induce a mass for the axion. So this field is not really a Goldstone boson because the Goldstone boson is massless. It's called a pseudo nambu Goldstone boson. Pseudo because it's almost massless up to these corrections here, okay? So you can also do a calculation for the mass and uh, I will give you just the result here. And actually more or less. So the mass of the axion is given by this combination. In the numerator, you have the mass of the pion and the decay constant of the pion. So this is 135 MeV, this is 92 MeV. So this is QCD scale physics, which is hundreds of MeV. And in the denominator, you have the breaking scale of the Pechequin symmetry. Not surprising that the effect goes like one over F because the mass comes from this operator. Okay, so if you send F to very large values, you reduce the coupling between the axion and the, and the gluons, and this mass from, comes from QCD effects. So the effect has to go down as you increase F. And uh, you can put numbers, and I think it's one electron volt for a decay constant of 10 to the 7 GeV.
OK. OK, so the last thing we need to do is to start. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. There is only one F, of course. There is only one F. There is only one F. And uh, yeah, you check the, the dimensions and what I wrote was wrong. So yes, it's phi over S, alpha S. Alpha S is the fine structure contrast of strong interactions. So it's uh, G squared over 4 pi for strong interactions. Thank you. OK. OK, so you see that now we will do the Rayleigh density calculation. And I anticipate the result. Axion dark matter is for F There are, again, some caveats here, but it's quite safe to say that what we will compute today is the following result. The axions can account for dark matter if F is bigger than 10 to the 10 GeV. So we are talking about the symmetry breaking at a scale much higher than the one we probe by experiments. And you see from this equation that the axion mass is at least milli electron volt. 10 to the 7 divided 10 to the 10, 10 to the minus 3, milli electron volt. So we are in a completely different mass range than what we saw uh, the first three lectures, where masses were above 10 GeV. Okay? And uh, let me also say that these small masses are possible only because the axon is a boson. You remember the second lecture, I think, I say that for a fermion, the mass has to be larger than 100 EV. For a scalar, the limit is much weaker, and it's like 10 to the minus 22 EV. So for scalars and for bosons in general, going down to such a low masses is not a problem. Okay? But this is something completely new with respect to what we have seen the first uh, three lectures. Okay. F, uh, this F here. Oh, FP. Oh, uh, these are just, so these are parameters of QCD. So m pi is the mass of the pion, and f pi, f pi is the pion decay constant. So it's something, it parameterizes the matrix element for the pion decay into uh, a lepton and neutrino, and like mu plus and a neutrino, and uh, it's, uh, we measure that by measuring the pion width. Okay, so it's, uh, well, I mean, in some sense, if, if you know kind of theories, pions are also Goldstone bosons. And so F is the scale associated to the pions. But yeah. Constraints on F. Yes. So uh, one constraint is that if we want the axion to be dark matter, F has to be large enough. But after doing the calculation and deriving that result, I will comment what other constraints we have on F. Because we have like uh, limits from stel uh, looking at stars, the way a star cools, experimental limits as well. So th there are, yeah. So we'll see. I mean, we, we can chat offline, of course. But uh, my goal for today's lecture is to go through the calculation very densely, and then we can uh, discuss more. But other questions? Very good. OK. We need one last ingredient, and then we can go and compute axion dark matter. So I was a bit sloppy here when I say that the axon gets a mass. Well, it's true. The axon gets a mass. This is a mass at zero temperature. Okay, So that's the axon mass in the universe today. As we consider the axon in the thermal bath of quark and gluons, this mass is temperature dependent. Okay, So if we want to track the evolution of the axon field as the universe expands, we need the expression for the axon mass at any temperature. So I will give you, this is, uh, it's actually there are still some, there is still some debate about the, axia, the, actual, the actual value for this mass. Uh, you can either estimate through QCD non perturbative calculations. The best way nowadays is to do lattice simulations. And there is still some disagreement, but to sketch this calculation is not crucial, the precise value. So I will just give you the result. And just to make sure our notation is, Consistent. I call this M0. This means mass at zero temperature. Okay. So now I will give you an equation for M phi. 
So m phi as a function of t. And roughly speaking, this is equal to m0 when we are below the QCD phase transition scale, so lambda QCD, let's say 200 MeV. So once I go through the QCD phase transition, the axial mass is frozen to its value at zero temperature. Once I go above the QCD phase transition, then I have to account for these effects and uh, So I, uh, and then of course this is T bigger than lambda QCD, bigger. And uh, you see that the mass decreases as we consider universe at higher temperatures. It decreases as a power law. And I define this uh, uh, behavior with this, the following exponential index, n over two, okay? This is just a convention. And uh, let me give you, so as I say, there is really not a consensus about the value of n, but the number worth keeping in mind, the range worth keeping in mind is between 6.8 and 7. Okay, so once you take half of this, the axial mass decreases as the temperature to the minus 3.5, more or less, okay? So this input will be very important because we want to solve the evolution for the, of the axion in the early universe. So we need to know the mass at any temperature, and this is the result. Yes? Why is there no consensus? It's, I think it's a challenging calculation to do. You have to do computer simulations on a lattice, and the lattice have some resolution power and computing power, so different collaborations were finding slightly different results. But the overall pictures will not be affected. So the calculation I'm going to do now uh, will not be affected by this, this range here. So. Sorry? Yeah, you can, you can trust uh, this at high temperatures. But around the scale where T is of the order of lambda QCD, you cannot rely on perturbation theory. And so when T is much larger than lambda QCD, you can definitely use effective with your techniques, but uh, around the QCD phase transition, the only way to go is, is a computer. Yes? Oh, I, as I will show, so these are, now we will, we will go through the derivation, and the way it works is that this is not particle dark matter in the sense that we have seen in the first lecture. So these are not like single particles. It's a condensate. It's a, it's a bosonic condensate, and as I will show, it behaves like cold dark matter. So from the point of view of virilization and formation of galaxies, it behaves precisely as, as the cold dark matter I've been talking about until now. So that, that's okay. There was another question. Well, in, in, the, in, the, in the early universe, now, uh, now the, this is also something that is debated at the, the present time. But for the purpose of right density calculation, there was a condensate and we can trust the calculation. Today, structure formation is, is, is still not known. But, but it's called dark matter, I will derive this result. Sorry, there was another question. Yeah, so I would say that the physical intuition is that QCD is asymptotic free. So if you consider strong interaction at very high energy scale or short length scale, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker. So that's property is called asymptotic freedom. So if you consider the universe at a very high temperature, then strong interactions are, are weak. And so the action gets mass through strong interactions. So that's why you can see why the the axial mass decreases with temperature because the interaction gets smaller and the interactions are what give the axon the mass. Very good, okay. So, Alpha S, yes. 
Exactly, exactly. So the, the, there is a connection between this interaction here, because the, the mass comes from this interaction. And, uh, and uh, you see that here there is an energy scale, the temperature. So it's precisely that. Oh. Uh, yeah, but this is a weakly couple. So this is true for, like, uh, for example, electrons in the, in the plasma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is this is a different uh, story. It's not like the electron coupled to the photons in the universe will get the d by mass proportional to t. Th this is different. It's, it doesn't come from that type of perturbative. This is a non-perturbative effects. Okay. So let, let's let's go now. The last thing I want to do is to compute the evolution of this field and compute how much energy density in axions I expect today, okay? So if I want to know how the axion field evolves, well, we know how we do that. We write down the equation of motions and we solve them. Okay, so I can delete everything. I will leave this last blackboard because it's good to have the axion mass. Okay. Evolution of the axion. Okay, so we consider the evolution of the uh, isotropic and homogeneous background. You can also perturb this equation to deal with perturbation, but I'm interested in rho, not on delta rho. Okay, so let's discuss the evolution of the fundamental mode of the axion, so it's a boson. And uh, the equation of motion for this, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this result. This is equation of motion for a scalar field in an expanding universe. And I'm sure we will see this a lot next week when we do inflation and uh, it's the same, same, same story, okay? So what do we see from this equation? This equation is the equation of an harmonic oscillator. It's uh, phi double dot, the second derivative of the field. It's equal to minus some frequency times the field itself. There is a damping term, okay? So this is... It's a damped harmonic oscillator. So the harmonic oscillator with a friction term. And uh, of course, as I mentioned already for WIMPs, if you write a paper on an axon, you want to produce some careful result, you give this equation to a computer and you solve the equation. So that, that's the way to go, okay? But since this is a lecture on a blackboard, we can do some approximation and get a feeling of how the final result depends on the fundamental parameter of the theory. But the right way to do this is, is of course, by, by solving the equation uh, numerically. Okay, so since we are about to see an, appro an approximate solution, let's identify two opposite regimes for this field. So, the first one is when T is very large. How large we will quantify in a second. But if T is very large, now look at the last blackboard. How, much is, how big is the axiom mass? Zero, right? If T is large, the axiom mass drops as a power law, and there is a T large enough when I can forget about the mass, okay? So if T is very large, then we can ignore the mass. And then we have only Hubble friction, okay? So we look at this equation. We forget about the mass. We forget about the oscillating part. And we get that Hubble wins. So it's what? keeps the axion stuck. A solution of this equation without the mass term is phi phi 
phi equal to a constant. Okay? If you put, if you forget about the mass and you look at this equation and you plug phi equal to a constant, that's a solution for the equation. So the axiom field doesn't move until the mass kicks in. So at very large temperature, the axiom field does not evolve. It's stuck. It doesn't move. Now, as we go to lower t, now we quantify in a second. We will quantify what large and small means, but I'm just giving the qualitative picture. Okay, then we will actually compute when this happens. For lower t, then the mass, the mass kicks in, okay, because now look again at the equation. Temperature gets lower, mass gets bigger. At the same time, Hubble is going down as the universe cools down. So there will be a time when the effect of this term in the equation becomes important. Okay? And so what we see, and we will see in a second, are What we see, and we will see that in a second, is that the axion field will start moving, because now this term will make it move. And it will move like, by following harmonic oscillator with a dumping term. So there will be harmonic oscillations, but the amplitude of this oscillation will be reduced with time as a consequence of this friction term, okay? So these are the two regimes. A very large temperature, the axion doesn't move, Lower temperature, the axion starts oscillating with an amplitude that is reduced with time. So the real question now is what is the temperature where we can interpolate these two opposite regimes? In other words, at what temperature the mass, the effect of the mass starts becoming important? And the way to estimate that is a hand waving wave, of course. If, if you solve the equation numerically, then you see this behavior as an output of your numerical calculation. But if you want to get an estimate of the order of magnitude of the temperature where this happens, well, you compare 3H with M, okay? In other words, you are comparing two time scales, okay? Hubble is a time scale, actually the inverse of Hubble. It's a time scale characteristic with the expansion. M is also a time scale. M is a frequency, and it's the frequency or equivalent to the, peri the period of these harmonic oscillations, okay? So at very high temperature, the time scale of Hubble definitely wins. There is no hope for the action to move. When these two time scales be become equal, then you start to see oscillations. Okay? So the way you get the, the answer to this question is by comparing two time scales or two rates, if you want. So let's do that. For the reason for the three, because of the three in this equation. So it's, it's just, and let, let for the estimate I'm about to do, we can forget that because three is equal to one to pi to, yeah. Okay, so Hubble, so I call T osh, 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 oscillation, the temperature where oscillations begin. So Hubble at this temperature is given by the usual value, T squared over M Planck, up to the order one factors. Now I look at the previous equation, I compare it with the mass. This is M0. You remember the value of the axiom at zero temperature is M pi F pi over F, okay? So that's the zero temperature mass. Of course, I don't have to forget the temperature dependence. Okay, so now in my theory, F is a free parameter. It's the only free parameter I have, because once I specify F, the axiom mass is something that I can compute, the zero temperature axiom mass. 
So if I look at this equation, the only unknown thing is T osh that appears here and appears here. So I can solve, let me do that in this blackboard, so. Uh, and uh, in the interest of time, let me just give you, yeah, let me just give you the result in this form. Uh, and the power is 0 0.185. Okay, so this is the result, okay? Uh, so you see that I put a number for f that it's in the interesting range as we will see in a second. What I want to emphasize is the dependence on f is actually pretty small because there is this small power index. And this 0 0.185 is a combination of this n and uh, so I think I put n equal to 6.8 to get this number. And uh, the real important number is this one, okay? It's 1.18 GeV, okay? So this equation tells us the, roughly speaking, the temperature scale where oscillations begin. Okay, so the axion field is stuck all the way to few GeV, and few GeV is the temperature of the universe when the universe starts, when the axion starts oscillating, okay? So if we want to make a plot, of the value of the axion as a function of time. So this is phi and this is t. So t here is the time of the friedman robertson walker metric. So at the very beginning, phi doesn't move. Hubble friction, so this is, let's call this Hubble friction. Okay, so let me, I forgot what I have to write afterwards, so it's good if I, okay, this is the time, and uh, I identify the oscillation time. Let me use a different color. So at the very beginning, the axion field is stuck, and it doesn't move because of upper friction. When the time gets to T osh, so time, T osh is the time corresponding to this temperature. I can solve the Friedman equation and find the relation between time and temperature. Once I get here, I start oscillations, and these oscillations are like this. I'm exaggerating, of course, because on the blackboard I cannot do a better job, but. So this is the evolution of the axion field in the early universe. It doesn't move all the way to a given temperature because of the, the effect of upper friction. Below that temperature, the oscillations can begin. And you see this oscillation, and by the way, the frequency for the, of this oscillation is the axion mass. And the, the reason why the amplitude gets damped with time is because there is a friction, Hubble friction. Okay, so what we are left to do for today, and we have 20 minutes, so I'm confident we will do that, is to understand how to describe the energy density stored in these oscillations all the way to today, so we can make an estimate of rho axion today, okay? Because this is an harmonic oscillator with friction, so it loses energy because of friction, but there is energy density stored in that. And so we want to describe the evolution of this energy density. Okay, um, so I, I will leave this plot here because it's useful. And then I leave also the equation of motion. So first of all, somebody asked me before 
Is this cold dark matter or not? So let me start by showing you that this energy density stored in the oscillation behaves exactly like cold dark matter. Okay, why? Energy density. So the energy density stored in the field is the sum of the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. Okay? It's just an harmonic oscillator, okay? Uh, you can convince yourself that the period of this oscillation is much, much shorter than the damping time, okay? So you can apply the virial theorem also to this oscillation. And the virial theorem will, describes, will describe the average so if you write the total rho as kinetic plus potential, the virial theorem says that the average kinetic energy over one oscillation is equal to the average potential energy. So this is just, so we, we mentioned the virial theorem in the first lecture, I think. And the virial theorem was for Newton force, one over r square. Harmonic force is one, it's not one over a square, it's proportional to R. So the Virial theorem holds, but it's a bit different. It says that the average kinetic energy over one oscillation is equal to the average potential energy over one oscillation. So with this in mind, what we really want to do is to compute V rho over dt. So how does rho evolve with time? Well, rho evolve with time, well, we, we just do the calculation. We just write down one half phi square plus. Here I haven't done anything. I just applied the definition of rho. Now I start two derivatives. So this is phi dot phi double dot plus m square phi dot phi. I collect phi dot. Okay, so in the, the first step is just applying the definition, easy. Second step, also easy, Deriva, time derivative, chain rule. Third step, I factor out a factor of phi dot, and now I look back at the equation of motion, and I know that the term in the square bracket is minus three times Hubble times phi dot, just because of the equation of motion. During the evolution, the axon, of course, respects the equation of motion. 3h phi dot square. Let me write that 3h q times phi dot square over 2. Again, I haven't done anything deep here. But this is the kinetic energy. Okay, so this is rho k. And since the kinetic energy is equal to the potential energy, of course, average over one oscillation, twice the kinetic energy is also the total energy because is kinetic is equal to potential, so K plus V is like QK because K is equal to V, okay? So I end up with minus three H rho phi, okay? So this equation shows that the energy density stored in this oscillation is not constant over time, why? Because the oscillations are damped. There is a friction, Hubble. Hubble is annoying. It, it, it gives friction to, to the axon field. And so this equation in this board here shows you how the energy density red shifts with time. And you can show that if if you have an equation phi dot minus three h rho phi, the solution is rho phi redshift as a to the minus three, okay? So something that redshifts as a to the minus three is no relativistic matter, or ident uh, equivalently is something with zero pressure, okay? So this is a cold condensate that behaves like cold dark matter, and so, is a viable dark matter candidate. Now, uh, the last thing I want to do is, 
Well, we know that draw phi behaves well in the sense that he has the redshift behavior, which is the way we want. But how big is rho phi today? Okay? And we want to make sure that rho phi today is precisely giving an omega dark matter of 27%. Okay, so that's the last thing we do. I still have 15 minutes, I guess. Okay, let's, ah, no, okay. Okay, so there are two ways to get to, yes? Decaying? So that's not a decay, that's just reducing the amplitude of the oscillation, but it's not like having a decay term in the, in the, in the, yes. Yeah, the amplitude decreases with time. That's correct, yes, yes. It doesn't disappear. So the amplitude of phi today, I will do that now, yeah, yeah. So what I want to do is to compute rho of phi today, okay? This is rho phi today, and rho phi today is rho k plus rho v today, and by applying the Virat theorem again, this is the result. So it's twice the potential energy because of the Virat theorem. Kinetic and potential are the same. So it's the mass today square times the amplitude today square. The mass today, we know it's today, the, the temperature of the universe is way below 200 MeV, okay? So we know this. What we don't know is phi zero today. Okay, so that's what we will do today. What we will do now. And uh, so there are there are two ways to get to this answer. One is to solve the differential equation numerically, as I mentioned before, and that gives you an output for phi zero. But what I want to do is to use an approximation which gives the right order of magnitude estimate for rho phi. And this approximation is the following. So this goes back to classical mechanics. Okay. Now for mechanics, forget everything I told you about the axion. So I give you a Lagrangian like this. Lagrangian in classical mechanics, not in field theory. So this is Euler Lagrange equation in classical mechanics. So it's kinetic energy minus potential energy. Lagrangian is L minus T minus v, K minus V. I just multiply this Lagrangian by the cube of the scale factor. Okay. Now you can compute the Euler Lagrange equation for this Lagrangian. And again, I emphasize this is not field theory. This is just classical mechanics techniques. Okay? I give you a Lagrangian where this is the variable, the coordinate, the co this is the coordinate, phi. This is phi dot. I can derive the Euler Lagrangian equation and you can show that you get this, okay? So the equation of motion of the axion is the same as the one derived by using classical mechanics techniques to this Lagrangian. Now, the key point to realize here is that uh, the axion, um, so the, these are harmonic oscillator with a given frequency m, so the mass of the axon is the frequency of the oscillation because omega square appears in the force term. And uh, the parameters are changing with time. Humboldt is changing with time. M is also changing with time. But they are changing slowly compared to the time scale of the oscillation. That's something we can check. And I'm giving just you the answer because of, of time. But for a system like this where the parameters are changing slowly, 
there is something called the adiabatic invariant. Adiabatic invariant. Uh, this is something you, you, you find in, the, for example, in the textbook by Landau, Lisch, it's volume one. Okay, so classical mechanics. And uh, if, as it is the case for this equation, the parameters appearing in the equation are changing slowly with respect to the time scale of the system, which is the inverse of the mass, which is the, the, oscillation, the frequency of the oscillation, the period of the oscillation. Then this adiabatic invariant is defined as the integral over one orbit of p phi d phi, where p phi is the conjugate momentum with respect to the variable phi. And now I look at the Lagrangian. P phi, it has to be A cube phi dot. I hope I got it right. Yes, okay. Okay, so the way you do this calculation is you compute the adiabatic invariant and then you impose since this is a constant through the evolution of the field, you impose that the value of this adiabatic invariant i that you compute at the time when the oscillation starts, what I call Tos, is equal to the value of i today because it's constant, okay? And that's a way to relate the axion amplitude at the very beginning of time when it started oscillating to the axion amplitude today. Okay, so since I have five minutes left, I'll just give you the answer, but uh, it is a straightforward calculation. Okay, so the adiabatic invariant is A cube, M, uh, just M. Phi square, phi square, okay? So, the way to get the amplitude of axion oscillation today is to compare this value at the time of the oscillations and today. So, at the time of oscillation, the scale factor, I call it A osh cube. The axion mass, well, I know it's temperature dependence, and I know an expression for this temperature, so I can plug this expression and find the mass at that time. And this is the initial value of the axion field, okay? And uh, today, this is the scale factor today, A0 cube. As already said, the axion mass today is M0, the one at the very top of the other blackboard. And uh, phi zero square is the amplitude of this, the axion today. So this equation gives me a way to evaluate, uh, phi, actually we, I can write this, I can multiply by M zero here and by M zero here, and I divide by A zero here. And what I have on the right-hand side of this equation is the axion density today. It's m squared phi squared. It's one half the potential energy times two, Virial theorem, again. And here I know everything because the ratio of scale factors is the ratio of temperatures. We know how the temperature evolves, the CMB temperature. So it's something I can compute. And uh, since I'm almost out of time, let me give you the answer and uh, I will comment on the answer. So you can compute after a few trivial steps, the contribution of omega, let me call it omega axion. So this is the energy density stored in this oscillation of the field. And I normalize this as 0 0.27, which is the number I like because it's the number I measure, times phi i over f square times F uh, 
to the power of 1.18. So that's something, if you do just a few trivial steps, you can derive. So to conclude, we have a way to compute energy density stored in this oscillation. You see that this is something we never mentioned, but the final answer will depend on the initial condition of the axion. So I have an equation of motion. And in order to solve the equation of motion and find the value of the variable today, I need to know the initial condition. I know it was at rest. So this is a second order differential equation. The time derivative was zero at the beginning. That's something I know. The initial amplitude is something I don't know. And uh, it depends. Well, now there are a lot of, uh, there is a lot of other things to say because it depends if this symmetry was broken before or after inflation. If it was broken before inflation, then inflation extended, I mean, the universe expanded exponentially. And so now within the upward horizon today, we only have one value of phi i. And so this value, uh, it's reasonable to take it to be order one, phi i over f of order one. But um, there are other reasons to also prefer a, the, the, a smaller value. But anyway. I think it is reasonable to say whether you have paycheck win broken before or after inflation, this ratio is naturally of order one, unless you have some additional reason to take it to be small, and there are reasons. So this equation tells us that the interesting range for f is 10 to the 11 GeV, okay? And uh, what else to say? So this, this contribution is called misalignment. Uh, because the key of this mechanism is that the axion field was displaced by its minimum, and so it could oscillate as the universe evolves. So misaligned because it was misaligned with respect to the to the, its the, its, uh, its, uh, its value corresponding to the minimum energy. So there could be other contributions coming from the network of domain walls and strings that form at the phase transitions. These are only there if paycheck queen is broken after inflation, and they can have an impact as big as this, and there is still debate about the size of these contributions. But I, I would say that the last two things I want to say is that 10 to the 11, 10 to the 10, or bigger are interesting value for axion dark matter. Phi can be at most of order F up to Q pi factor, so f cannot be too small. But you can make f larger if you make phi i over f smaller. And that's something that requires some justification, but you can. And uh, somebody before mentioned other bounds on f. So there are bounds on f, for example, because if the axions are there, they could be a way to cool down the sun. So axion can be producing the sun, and they just escape the sun, because they are so weakly coupled to us. So by studying stellar structure or even supernovae, the way supernova explosion works in the presence of an axion, we found bounds on F, but they are smaller than this. So the interesting region for axion dark matter, F larger than 10 to the 10, is viable. There is no experiment telling us that, uh, no bound telling us that we cannot live in this region. F equal to 10 to the 7 would be excluded by this consideration of stellar bond. 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11, and bigger value. Of course, the bigger you go, the safer you are, because you decouple the axion. So smaller values of f are a problem. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the reason why I wanted to give this lecture is because the idea of axion dark matter is old. But new experimental ideas uh, have been put forward in the last five, at most 10 years, to test a much wider range of f. So the previous ideas were focused on the axion wind of around this uh, 10, 11, 10 to 11 GV value because of this equation. But as I said, there is another unknown quantity here. So the range of F where you can get dark matter is actually bigger. And if you want to know more about these ideas, come and talk to me. So I'm out of time. I stop here. I thank you very much for your question, both during the lecture and after lecture. It was a lot of fun for me. And as I said, I will be around also next week, not just this week. Uh, way more relaxed because I don't have to prepare the lectures at night. So if you see me around and you want to talk more, feel free to talk to me. Thank you.